is Leningrad, USSR. And this is Seattle, Washington, in the United States. Today, these citizens from the Soviet city and these citizens from the U.S. city will talk by television satellite on a Citizens Summit. In Leningrad alone, we buried so many people, as many people during the war as were lost by all of America. What is the city of Gorky and what is it used for? We're very worried about missiles in West Germany, cruise missiles in the UK, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and the rest of Europe. Why are these missiles in Europe? Outside our studio at this moment are gathered several protesters. Hosted in Seattle by Phil Donahue and in Leningrad by Vladimir Posner. Participants in a citizen summit are free to discuss whatever they wish. No subject will be off limits. The Soviet and American audiences are men and women who work in factories, schools, hospitals, and their own homes. They are students and fishermen, farmers and physicians. They'll meet each other face to face next on A Citizen's Summit. that Riza, uh, Secretary Gorbachev's wife, was a lecturer on Stalin, on Leninism and Marxism before she was married. What kind of pay would she might, might a person get in that uh, situation today? Everyone who works in the Soviet Union receives a salary. May we ask why the question was met with such laughter? You're wrong if you think that Gorbachev's wife tells all of us what her salary is and what kind of work she gets it for. I would like for you to list two or three uh, things that your government can do to ease the tension of nuclear war as steps to bring about uh, peace in the world. Anybody? Anyone else like to reply? Yes, sir. The first thing would be a um, moratorium on nuclear testing and explosions. And the second thing would be a reduction of nuclear armaments on the whole and then a reduction of all weaponry. Therefore, for that reason, Gorbachev at the summit meeting stated that, and our government has always stated that, this has to be done. What about your side? What about our side? Our government, in fact, has declared that is the it will not be the first for a nuclear strike. Who I wants to ask questions? We have a question for you. What has your government done for the sake of peace? Give us at least three. <laughs> or even one. Fine. I think that we're all in accord on those three particular items and why we have to do that. I think the problem is, how do we go about making sure we both do it at the same time? It's, we're very pleased here to hear from our dear friends this evening that you think, as we do, that 
measures to strengthen peace and to guarantee peace should be carried out in this world. And this is particularly pleasant since the proposals made by our government regarding 50% reductions in weapons are proposals which you consider as your proposals too. Apparently, this is what both of our peoples think and that doubtless will assist our governments in resolving problems which arise. But it seems to me that we've somehow gotten a bit off the track from what could be the topic of our talks today. We've gotten to here together today to get to know each other better. If we're only going to be talking about lofty political subjects, and those have already been discussed by the leaders of our countries, those have been discussed quite clearly, and I think they've been, the positions have been stated perfectly accurately. If we do that, I think that it's going to be a kind of amateurish repetition of what professionals have already said. Maybe there are other topics we could discuss here, and then we'd really get to know each other better, and we'd get to understand each other better. In that connection, you should know that there's a good deal of skepticism in the United States about the uh, integrity of the statements that you will make. Not a few Americans believe that you are not really able to speak from your soul for fear of reprisal from uh, Soviet government authorities. There are even some people in this country who feel that you will all serve as mouthpieces for the official party line because to do otherwise might earn you a visit to a psychiatric hospital or perhaps a prison. This is not to say that all Americans believe that. This is not to say that you are dishonorable people. It is rather to honestly share with you the perception that millions of Americans have about uh, life in the Soviet Union and the inability to speak one's mind. Lev Yakovlev, I'm a teacher, my name is Yakovlev. Everyone, in fact, uh, broke out in laughter when they said we might end up in a psychiatric hospital. We express our views from the heart, and we, in fact, listen to our government very carefully. We support it because it's right. No one in the Soviet Union wants war. We, in fact, waged a war so there'd be no more war. So there'd be peace the world over. And our question is, why do the Americans not respond to a moratorium on nuclear testing? There was a recent underground testing of a new nuclear bomb. And from the very beginning, since Hiroshima, we've been asking for a moratorium. We have done a great deal, and we require that the Americans do the same. And we're not afraid to speak out. How can we show you that, that we are not all from the Secret Service here and that we all go to the psychiatric ward? Perhaps this is the practice of another country you know of, but this is not the practice in our country. We don't have this. I'm also a teacher in a normal school. And I asked my children when I was preparing for this meeting, what would you like to know? Of course, they had difficulties because they know your country very well, and none of them at all thought that you couldn't say what you thought. Why do you think that about us? Well, if that's the case, then I'd like to ask the questioner, what is the city of Gorky, and what is it used for? Uh, this man implies that Gorky is a place to which uh, critics of the Soviet system are sent, including Andrei Sakharov. Well, the name of Sakharov and of others sometimes enter our newspapers, and I think that he has slandered the Soviet Union. These are my words. My own view is that he is a traitor. And a traitor should not be treated liberally, but as he deserves. This addresses a fundamental difference in our societies. Because we can have healthful protest 
without fear of reprisal from government authorities. And our feeling is that you do not. Hang on just a moment, please. I'd like to speak to that. I really don't trust. I was born in that area, and I very much like that city, the city of Gorky. I love that city. You missed it the point, sir. Exile. It's a very nice country Excuse me. which songs are written. Excuse me, sir. You missed the point. We are agreed that Gorky is a wonderful city. That is not the question. The question is, why, because someone dissents from Soviet policy, are they immediately called a traitor? That is offensive to America's understanding of free speech. Unlike America, we have laws in the Soviet Union which, in fact, forbid propaganda of war and hatred for the peoples. And since 1917, peace with all peoples. And Sakharov has even encouraged you to begin a war against us. And our government sent him where there are no foreign consulates, so he could not use these against the Soviet Union for anti-Soviet propaganda against me. Yes, but I don't know whether you fully appreciate the passion with which millions of Americans view the restricted lives of the Soviet people. This is especially an agony uh, within the Jewish community who believe there are thousands of Jews in Russia who cannot emigrate simply because they are Jewish or because of uh, some unjustified uh, Soviet reasoning. Phil, this wasn't so much a question as a statement, which uh, I would like to reply to and say the following. And of course, anybody who has had uh, sufferings, who has suffered about this, we can understand that the, the question is why you have such uh, bitter experiences. Where have they come from? Why do you only have negative experiences? Where are the positive experiences? You assume that we only uh, have a country consisting of uh, so many million unhappy people. You can leave the Soviet... Do you say that the, the, the Jews can't leave the Soviet Union because they're Jews? Basically, in fact, Jews are the main immigrants, not the others. It's much easier for them, in fact, to emigrate. Well, uh, uh, why would 250,000 Jews emigrate from the Soviet Union? I'd like Union? to know how you have such passionate feelings about our country. Why, where'd you get this figure from? Did you hold a referendum in our country or what? We know because we receive letters and we have people here who have visited Russia and talked to Jews who have waited for years and years. We call them refuseniks. They're people who desperately want to go to Israel, some to be reuni reunited with their families. And those of us here in the United States care very deeply that those people, along with any other people in the world that want to leave where they are and go to their homeland, be allowed to do so. And it brings us great heartache, and we want to do something to help these people. Vladimir, let me take just a moment to show you very briefly another example of uh, America's uh, most beloved freedom, that of free speech. Outside our studio at this moment are gathered several protesters. What you see here is America's uh, free speech in action. They believe that they should have been entitled to access to this program to complain about human rights violations that they claim to have a good deal of evidence about in your country. Uh, this is merely to say to you or to offer to you evidence of the widespread belief that the Soviet Union's uh, interest in peace is significantly undermined by the treatment of many of its people. And I might say also that the leading newspaper, or one of the largest newspapers in this city, also has condemned this program, suggesting that this audience is rigged and so is yours. So we come to you bloodied but unbowed and we want you to know that if we appear to be preoccupied with the issue of human rights, it is because we feel we are reflecting the interests uh, of the American people.
It was very interesting to see that demonstration, Phil, protesting against our friendly talks. And there are children there, too. What do they understand? Doesn't it seem to you that someone is paying for them to do this? I have a question to ask of you, the Americans. Why do you um, issue such films when you censor other films, uh, which, such as Red Dawn, which are against the Soviet Union? We can see this about you, from your very tactless question. Why do you allow this to happen? Don't you believe what you're doing yourself? Why do we allow what to happen? In Leningrad, listen to me. In Leningrad alone, we buried so many people, as many people during the war as were lost by all of America. And you know this full well. And who's, to whose advantage is it to us to um, uh, have propaganda against us, including children in the demonstration? Answer me why this is happening. Who, to whose advantage is it? Does anybody want to speak to that? To whose advantage? To whose advantage are the protesters speaking? You, you'll stand. Uh, it, is, it is to your advantage, sir, the way we see it. We, we believe that each person should be free to speak his mind. We know that the American government, the government of the United States, is wrong many times. Uh, one of the things that bothers me about many of the comments that I hear from Leningrad is that there seems to be some feeling, which was expressed earlier, that the Soviet government is right, or always right. If I use that line of reasoning, I would have to ask you, would you agree then that the government of Adolf Hitler was always right for the German people? I'd like to answer that. I'd like to say that we choose our government so that our government can carry out our will. I don't understand how I could be in disagreement with a person who is doing what I want him to do. If I were to ask someone to do something, and he did that, then I can't disagree with that. In addition, I want to say that I personally took part in a meeting, in a protest meeting. It protested against militarization. All of us, all of us in Leningrad got together on Vasiliev Island, and I remember that we all fully agreed with the policy of our government. We do have demonstrations. At the demonstrations, we express our views openly and frankly. Here in the United States, as a citizen, I think that our You are saying a great deal here. Uh, hold on just one moment, Vladimir, if you will, please. Um, I feel that our nation does a lot of very unjust things. We have completely wiped out the, Amer the in American Indians that existed here. We, slavery existed in our country. We supported Somoza and we support Marcos in the Philippines. And we do a lot of very ugly things. But it is our ability to be able to recognize this and to be able to work for social change. And my ideas may not always agree with everybody else's, but it is the fact that I can express that idea and that I can be in disagreement that allows a free marketplace of ideas to exist. All right, let me... If you had the opportunity to take a look at our newspapers, you would find more criticism in our papers than anywhere else. Real criticism, genuine criticism, and to the point criticism. Criticism both of our governmental organizations and our social institutions, etc. We make use of the same kind of democratic rights as you do. And I'd also like to say that freedom of speech is wonderful. Freedom of speech is a great thing. But if nobody listens to that speech, then what use is its freedom? We don't get the feeling that your protests against the policy of militarization, against Star Wars, we don't feel that your protests really result in serious reaction on the part of your government. I think that your government listens, but it doesn't hear.
yes, uh, welcome to, to the Russian people. Uh, I came here today because uh, uh, I was asked to because of my occupation. I'm a fisherman in Alaska, and I got a chance to meet some of your uh, Russian fishermen up there in Dutch Harbor. Uh, I wish this wouldn't be all so political and we could get to know you. Uh, I think it's a bad way to start. I wouldn't have come here if I would have known it was going to be this political. I thought I'd get to get a chance to know more of the Russian people. Uh, this show, you've got to realize, is one of controversy, and that's what they're trying to do now. And I really feel unfortunate. I wish we could sit down and meet with you and talk Why our life. you ask a question? Uh, really took the words out of my mouth. What we're doing here? We've been told that for two and a half hours we're going to speak, or three, and it's going to be very interesting and very speedy. But there's nothing interesting. I just simply want to get out of here. I thought I'd find something interesting and new out, and that they'd find something interesting out about us, but nothing has happened. Gentlemen, you're talking about what you know better than us. You know this better than we do. There are no re questions and no replies. You're uh, talking about us. Uh, saying, saying about us things we don't even know ourselves. And we want to have something more yes. than what you simply know about us or think you know about us. One of these Soviet teachers uh, said they asked their students uh, what they'd like to know about America. I'm a teacher too, and I asked my students here. And we have the phrase in America, the American dream. And for some, it means financial independence. For others, the ability to go from the, literally from the log cabin to the White House. My students want to know what is the Russian dream. I'll repeat this question because we didn't hear it. He's a teacher, and he teaches the American dream, which makes it possible for everybody to reach the White House and to be financially independent. No. What dream do we teach to our children? Uh, Vladimir, uh, excuse this, me, Vladimir. This is a teacher. Vladimir, may I, may I interrupt? That's close. That's close. I, this gentleman, as a teacher, was asked by his students to inquire of your audience what is the what is the soviet dream what is the personal hope and dream of the people in your audience may we hear from perhaps someone who hasn't had an opportunity to speak perhaps somebody who hasn't answered a question yet you know, I think that each person has his very own dream because we're all individuals, you and we. So I'd like to talk about my dream. I'm still quite young. So perhaps I may have some idealistic notions about life. I'd like to have a lot of nice children. I'd like to have a good husband. I'd like to have good work. I don't want to leave my beautiful city. I don't want to go anywhere. I know my city very well because I'm an art historian by education. And my dream includes a great many parts to it, but mostly it depends on whether we're really going to be able to live in peace because nothing would be realized unless we make efforts to ensure that this comes about. And that's why I really want to fight for peace. Might, might I inquire about your perceptions of Americans, not America as a political institution, but what do you feel about us? What do you think about us? How, what do you think about our lives? You've uh, answered before. Let's have people who haven't answered before. It seems to me that you're really very nice people, and we're nice people too. And we really want to be friends with you as much as you do with us. We extend our hands to you, and we'd like to see a lot more friendship, understanding, and trust. We'd like to see a lot of trust. We are not enemies. I'd like to ask a question. A great deal has been said here regarding the Soviet Union, and it's clear that the idea the American public has of our life is not totally in keeping with reality. I would like to ask whether in the audience there, there's anybody who's been to the Soviet Union. And what was the relationship between your idea of the Soviet Union before and after your trip? I think that an answer to that would really give a genuine answer to the questions that have been raised here. You've been to the Soviet Union? I just got back about a month ago, and we were in Leningrad. And I was amazed. It was much freer, much more relaxed. We had a marvelous time. It was much better than what we had been prepared for. One of the things I've been reading, following along the lines of what this woman up here had said, was about the role of women 
in Russia and that, yes, they have equality in terms of a job, but they also get to come home and take care of the house and take care of the children and stand in the long lines to buy the food. I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, let's have it, uh, ladies. Which lady would like to answer? Yes, ma'am. In the Soviet Union, we have all conditions to ensure that women can participate in public life of our city, in managing government affairs, various government bodies, in cultural life. We have children's kindergartens, daycare centers, and schools. The schools have extended day programs for children if the mother or the father has to work and can't come to pick up the child. So we have all the best possible conditions to ensure that Soviet women can work in peace. And I also want to say that a question was raised as to how we feel about Americans. I think nobody's answered it so far. You know that prior to this meeting, it seemed to me that perhaps you're not being told the truth about us or maybe it wasn't true that we were being told that you have those ideas and now I'm really convinced that there really are differences and I think you should think about you really think that this is a rigged audience that we were specially chosen believe me that isn't true and even at the highest levels they said believe us and I'd like to say the same thing that you should believe us nobody forced us to come here compelled us to come here we came here perfectly freely and we're saying exactly what we think and exactly what we want to say so please believe us we are what we are um, I'd like to address an issue that was raised earlier. A lot of the people in this, in this audience pointed out that there's a lot of freedom of speech in this country. And I wanted to say that for a lot of political activists in the U.S., they are still monitored and harassed by the U.S. government. So it is not as if political activists in this country have complete freedom to say what they choose. I know many activists in Seattle who are monitored by the government. So it's not as free as people would like to make you think. And my question, my question is in regards to racial issues. Um, there seems to be still a lot of racial discrimination in the U.S. It's not talked about, but it's there. It's very strong, especially in major cities. For example, in Seattle, uh, there is an area in which there is a high concentration of minorities, and then you have places like Bellevue, which is as white as snow. And I was just wondering, how is it in the USSR, like, say, for Asians? Is there racial distinction, say, in living areas? How is uh, racial discrimination in the USSR? You asked a question. I'm a representative of one of the small nationalities, the Munsi. This is a very small group. It lives in the north of our multinational country. And I have exactly the same rights as any other citizen of our country. I have the right to be elected to our government, and I have the right to vote, too. I would like to follow up on the question, what do we think about Americans? This is of great interest to me because I was several times in the U.S. I must say that I really liked Americans. They're very open, they're very sociable, very straightforward. But I can tell you that there are some things that really astonished me and my colleagues, how ill-informed Americans are about freedom of press they talk and they talk about other things. But we were in Seattle, and there were such simple questions as, what Soviet films did you see? And the people we spoke with couldn't tell us because we didn't see any. Now, could the Americans answer the question, why is there such a difference in the level of information available? It's our belief that most of your information comes through your government, is censored by your government. In our country, we have the right to read whatever we want. We can go into a store that specializes in foreign books and get them. The problem is that not all of our citizens want to read them. So you come across a lack of information because people don't have the initiative to go out and get it themselves. It is available. Our perception of your country is that 
your government has pro Pravda, your, um, your government puts on your news. Our government doesn't put on our news. It's privately produced. They can say anything they want. We have values in our country that I'm sure are very much like the values in your country, but we don't get those values from you. I very often travel abroad, too, to different countries, <coughs> and there I very often see TV movies, and very often I see movies about Soviet soldiers and about 07, and usually people are given an old uniform. You usually see Russian soldiers wearing the kind of uniform that we used to have during the Civil War 65 or 70 years ago. Now, there are films. Now, the kind of films that we have now are Soviet films, are films which aren't shown on your television. You show the kinds of things that you've cooked up yourselves. Yes. Uh, I'm wearing this uniform in part to protest my own country's mistakes in Vietnam. Um, I'd like to, to say that we today have a fantasy with violence. Uh, we worship a man by the name of Sylvester Stallone who impersonated uh, someone like me who actually wore this uniform in Vietnam. And uh, he thinks he was a Green Beret and wishes to speak for people like me. But I know the reality of war. 22 million Russian people died uh, putting down uh, Nazism and fascism in World War II. And my dream is that, that uh, someday Vietnam veterans who uh, were deeply affected by the war and who know how wrong it was and who went there thinking that uh, it wasn't wrong and who learned th uh, through reality that it was wrong will be able someday to get together with Afghanistan veterans from your society. Yes, you two men wearing that uniform sitting there in that audience in Leningrad will be able to get together with you and be able to talk about how wrong war is and how futile it is. And it will be the burden of the Afghanistan veteran and Vietnam veterans to spread to the rest of our two respective societies the futility and wrongness of war. Thank you. First of all, I should like to wish the inhabitants of Seattle a happy new year and peace on earth. Now I have a question. Do you know Please tell me do your people know, and especially people in Seattle, about the blockade of Leningrad in the Second World War? If you're aware of this, then try to understand the Leningraders gathered here. Try to understand what we suffered, that what our children suffered. I was a child at the time. And even when we talk about shortcomings, but the most precious thing to us is peace on earth because of this. I still have good feelings from Americans because in 45, in Dessau on the Elbe, I met Americans. And they were really very nice. And I would like to have such good relations with all people, and I hope the same is true on your side. Thank you. Thank you for your warm New Year's wishes, and we would like to pass that on to you also. My question is with abortion, is that a problem in your country right now? Abortion, how do you mean is it a problem? Is there a choice? Do the women have a choice? And are the abortionists and the anti-abortionists fighting like they are in this country to, to um, establish who has the right? In our country, each woman decides on this issue herself. She decides that with her family members. If she wants to keep the child, she gives birth. If she doesn't want to, then she goes to the doctor who gives her a certificate, and then she has an abortion. Of course, it's free of charge also. Yes. Yes. I find it hard to believe with as many people that there is in Russia 
that if you don't, that everybody has to agree with the government. There has to be problems and there has to be a way of dealing with them and everything isn't just always hunky-dory. I am an artist and I've seen so many interesting faces among you. Eyes filled with hope and a desire to find out about each other. I would, in fact, like to paint his picture, that fellow. He has a normal human face. And I think we should try to get to know each other better and live together. I think it's the most important thing. Sir, the question raised by our American friends, they've been asking us why, in their view, are we avoiding answers to questions? And how we feel about the situation in Afghanistan, in Poland, and they're listing other countries. I think that everybody present here that people here don't feel they have to justify themselves. Yes, we do believe in our government, and we state that with perfect equanimity. We believe, most importantly, that it is our government, our government, which stated that it has committed itself never, ever, to attack anyone first. Can one fail to trust such a government and such a state? That is why. We are perfectly calm regarding the steps the government is undertaken. We have problems. We have a great many problems. They are economic and social problems, etc. And if you come to our country, and I'll get you there because I work for Aeroflot, the national airline, you will see that we b live with problems, to be sure. But for all that, in our state is one from which I would never, no, no matter where I have flown, regardless of the kinds of passengers I've had on my planes, I've always felt that I've never found someone who'd say that he was an enemy. Yes, I'm. I think it would not be a good idea to ask 10 times the question on Afghanistan and not recall or explain to us why you began a war and killed people in Vietnam, why you helped the Israelis to destroy Arab peoples around them, and why now you are concentrating forces in Lebanon, and why you destroyed Grenada, which was a free country, and why are you helping the Union of South Africa and, and go in their fight against Angola. And why have you used your forces to attack Nicaragua? We have not heard one response. I hope we will hear one. Well, I would also like to ask why some of you seem to feel that you're so right and don't give us the benefit of the doubt. I'd like to answer the gentleman's uh, question about our involvement in various foreign countries, uh, which I'm sure to many of you and to many of us appear wrong, is that our government has made mistakes. Um, if he wants to list off a list of countries we're involved in and have been involved in, I'd be happy to list off a country that their country has invaded um, with or without permission. Uh, the purpose of going tit for tat only shows that both of us have made mistakes and that uh, we can change these mistakes and come back and realize that we have done wrong someplace. Okay, what I'm, what my question is, is how did the people feel about the KAL flight that was shot down? Do you feel that was justified? Do you feel that that was a spy on a spy mission, or was it just innocent uh, plane off course? Phil, could I very briefly reply? I think we were having a conversation along the lines we wanted, uh, that is, about um, human relations. Uh, I think that I can re reply for our audience and say we are convinced that this was a spy plane, that this is a tragedy for the people, of course, who lost their lives and who were pawns in a very frightful game. We deeply regret this, and we hope that the agreement signed between our countries in uh, particular in the field of uh, overflights in that uh, area will make it impossible for uh, such uh, adventures, quote unquote, to reoccur. Uh, Vladimir, th th it should be said that um, 
the Americans see this kind of overreaction, the destruction of a civilian aircraft, in an age of black boxes and the ability to make judgments about what the other aircraft is, is evidence of, of a, um, a simplistic, rather knee-jerk, militaristic, non-thinking response on the part of a Soviet military bu bureaucracy that makes uh, Americans very, very anxious. Phil, I've already said that we are very sorry about those who lost their lives, but the Americans, in order to understand, should have all the information available, not only part of it. I would like to say that if a Soviet passenger plane for four hours had reached a, a four and a half mile height going over the main American um, weapons areas and didn't made no reply to American signals and didn't uh, react when they tried to make them land and ignored all signals, didn't get into contact with them. The Soviet Union would not warn the United States that this was a, pa a passenger ship and so on, a passenger plane and so on. I'm, af I'm afraid that our plane would have been shot down in just the same way. I'm afraid this uh, would have been so. Just one moment, Vladimir. Uh, it, it can be reasonably argued that if that happened, and if the American reconnaissance showed an Aeroflot civilian aircraft on which perhaps the stewardess with whom we spoke a moment ago may have been a passenger, that the technology exists to determine that that is a civilian airplane, even presuming ill intent, which we do not, I can say to you that there are a number of Americans who would reasonably argue that we would not have shot it down. We would have made our formal protest and offered evidence of the incursion. Well, fortunately, this hasn't got to be checked out because fortunately the Soviet Union will not send a civilian plane to spy on American territory. But I would like to say that I think that the armed forces of the United States would react precisely in that way. But let's agree to differ, if you will. That's my viewpoint. I have the following question. We're very worried about missiles in West Germany, cruise missiles in the UK, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and the rest of Europe. Why are these missiles in Europe? They shouldn't be in our continent, in Europe. America is far beyond the ocean. There is even airspace dividing us. Yes. America is even polluting the, the air with all of its missiles. And now we have to wait for bombs to come from the air here in the European continent and also from across the sea. And we're very worried about where these missiles are going to come from. So I would like to ask, what's the American view of this? What about these missiles in Europe? They shouldn't be there, should they? I would agree with you. They shouldn't be there. But I remember that during the Carter administration, and we had a president, President Carter, who some Americans considered very soft. And during his administration, he de-emphasized military buildup in America. And while he was doing that, the Soviets had the largest military buildup in the history of the Soviet Union, of which a large percentage of it was in eastern Germany. And maybe that's why we're concerned, and maybe that's why those missiles are there in western Germany. Some people might think it's a bit naive. I'd like to see, that's my dream, that every day women should be given flowers and they should feel like movie stars every day and all men should be gentlemen. Who should give them the flowers? And men, of course. And you should stay Americans, and we should remain what we are, Soviet people. Are we going to speak uh, these three minutes? 
Can uh, we speak? I'm happy or we'll to listen to questions. Could we speak or just Your have choice, more questions? Vladimir. Your choice. I think we've got three minutes left. Then may I ask you really how you felt about up. may I ask you, Vladimir, how you feel about what tr has transpired here? I have very complex feelings about what happened. I'm very pleased that it's happened. But what happened is indicated very precisely, I think, how difficult it is for us to talk with each other. I don't want to uh, sound flippant, but in the musical uh, My Fair Lady, there is a, a refrain when Higgins is uh, amazed at uh, Lisa says, why can't, like why can't a woman be more like a man? And he's very concerned about this. I think that sometimes we are demanding, we're asking each other, why aren't we more like each other? Why don't you act the same way as we do? This is not right. And today, I think, that if, we, if we've at least understood this on both sides, that we are in fact different, that each of us have their, has, its, has its own viewpoint, and that it's worth something. This will be a first step, albeit a trembling one, but a first step towards understanding. And when we understand, then we will no longer be afraid of each other. There'll be no paranoia. There'll be normal conversation. First and foremost, we have to understand. This is my feeling about today's meeting. May I say, Vladimir, May I say, please, um, we, do have, um, we do have prejudices about each other. And it gives me no joy to say that much of the reporting about your country in the West does have a Western spin. We aren't getting as much varied information about you as we should. It should also be said that your media is not famous for featuring American spokesmen, including our president. We also want you to know that we think what you do in your country is your business. But we, we ask you to believe that millions of Americans see the crushing of solidarity, solidarity in Poland as an autocratic move against the will of the people. They see the invasion of uh, Afghanistan similarly. The difference is that we argue our foreign policy decisions, and you do not. And it, we cannot overstate how discouraged Americans are to realize that we have such a powerful, enlightened nation of talented people, numbering all, over 260 million, who appear to be intimidated by a select few of males who make decisions about where Soviet uh, influence will be felt without any concern about how their own people feel, thereby denying yourself the wisdom of your own populace. That's what troubles us most. Nevertheless, we are impressed with all that you've done to rally from the ashes of World War II. We have babies we want to save, and we know you do too. And we're hopeful that while this dialogue will not solve all the world problems, we hope that it is the toe in the water and that it is the beginning of a series of exchanges that will allow us each other to know each other better and perhaps in the long term save more of our babies. We thank you very, very much for this dialogue. Undersigned participated in the satellite link up between Seattle, USA, and Leningrad, USSR, on December 29, 1985. It's your signature saying, I was there for the first one. The first one, and what we hope will be a long series. Yeah, exactly of the same paper Thank you.
transportation for Phil Donahue and all involved in a citizen summit has been provided by TWA. Leading the way, TWA. Accommodations provided by the Four Seasons Olympic Hotel. Luxurious rooms and infinite attention to detail in the heart of Seattle.